I don't necessarily see my work as dark, but I think a lot of my audience does, so I might use that word to describe it because that's how other people would see it, but to me, death isn't a dark thing and taxidermy isn't a dark thing. Like, if anything, it's about life and it's about celebrating life. I was an unusual child, as you might be able to imagine, and when I was a kid I was drawn to unusual things and I was always interested in death and always talking about it and um, I guess that's quite normal for kids to go through that phase, I just didn't grow out of it. <laughs> a lot of people tell me that when they hear about my work they think it sounds quite frightening and upsetting but when they actually see it they think the animals have been treated with respect and with love and that they look sweet and innocent and beautiful and peaceful and I guess that's more what I'm trying to achieve than anything that would be considered dark. Ethical taxidermy is a, a big movement that's happening now. Like when I first started learning taxidermy, people didn't really have an understanding of that. It was just seen as this creepy thing and it was really a conversation stopper. Like when I told people I was learning taxidermy, they would sometimes literally turn around and walk away from me. It's come a long way now, it's, you know, it's quite fashionable and people realise that you don't have to go and shoot something to have it on your wall. Everything has died of natural causes and the majority of the animals I work on are stillborn. So I have farmer contacts where I get stillborn lambs and calves from. Um, I have co contacts with other taxidermists which is where I generally get the exotic animals from. People donate their pets to me when they die. Um, I find birds and mice and stuff around where I live and where I work. I guess it's you know, like you're giving life to something in a way, like new life. I'm really interested in the idea of why we think it's acceptable to eat some animals and not others. And you know, like when I put a kitten in a copper pot, people lose their shit and can't really handle it. But you put a lamb on a platter and it's a bit more acceptable, like it's still confronting to people, but there's all these lines. People would abhor the idea of eating a giraffe but really it's equally sentient to a cow and there's not really any difference when it comes down to the suffering. We're just conditioned to believe that one is okay and the other one isn't. This show is called Wholeness in the Implicit Order and it's based on um, theoretical physicist David Bohm's book which is called Wholeness and the Implicate Order. The whole concept started when I acquired a baby giraffe from uh, the freezer of a museum in Tasmania. It had died at the Adelaide Zoo over 30 years ago and had been in this freezer ever since. Because he'd been in the freezer for so long, um, traditional taxidermy was, wouldn't have worked because if you skinned the animal all of his fur would have fallen out. So we had to freeze dry it and so we basically all of the organs and brains are removed but all of the muscle and bone is still inside and he gets wired up and posed and everything and goes in this big industrial freeze dryer which sucks all the moisture out and he's yeah essentially preserved or giraffe jerky as we affectionately call him. There's also a baby juvenile zebra, I think it was about one one when it died at the zoo, and three lion cubs as well. There's this interesting thing that happens when I make work that stuff just seems to come together, even if it, it seems like they might be strange bedfellows. I had a few kind of personal transformations I've been through over the last four or five years, and in that process, read some interesting books and started looking into quantum physics and holographic universe theory and that led me into wanting to learn how to make holograms. Taxidermy I guess has that real feeling of like being quite antiquated, you know, like a, a hunter's club or lodge or something and then holograms are that quintessential like 
futuristic but like cheesy futuristic and so the idea of kind of capturing taxidermy in a hologram is a really nice juxtaposition to me. And then there's another piece called Venerium Vitae which is kind of like a CV of my sexual history. Much to my mother's horror, for my 18th birthday I went to the op shop and got a whole bunch of like little girls white knickers and wrote the directions in red pen in the crotch and I kind of feel like that was my first good idea. So for this show I've revisited that and it's confronting to put stuff like that out there where people can read it. So I feel like if you're an artist and when things become comfortable and easy and you know that people are going to like it and you just keep doing that, then you're not really making art, you're just making money and I think you need to be pushing yourself to that place where you're scared about showing things to people. Most people consider gold and diamonds and those sort of things very precious and to me as a jeweller, they have a material value but they're not necessarily precious because I have access to whatever I want. Whereas as an ethical taxidermist I have to wait for an animal to die of natural causes to come to me. That then makes the animal more, more precious than the diamonds and the gold and rubies and things that I use. But then to take that a step further, that life of that animal is then more precious than the dead animal is to me as well. So it's kind of making people question these things. And especially, you know, if you take a rat or something and give it two carrots of black diamonds for eyes, and all of a sudden this thing that people are terrified of, they're then spending thousands of dollars on one and putting it on their wall. And I, I find that kind of funny and interesting to be able to change something like that in someone's eyes.